For our final plenary speaker before, the, before lunch, we are bringing Jerry Rode, uh, who's a local historian, to, to, uh, to share some of his perspectives. Jerry lives and works in the North Coast, though he's a, a Californian by history, and he has uh, a, a wide uh, repertoire of experiences, but he's also worked as a consultant for archaeologists, independent research enterprises, and tribes. Um, and he's also an accomplished author of several guidebooks of the North Coast Redwood Parks, and he's written a recent book with his wife called Both Sides of the Bluff, um, which is a first volume of a four-part geographical history of Humboldt County. For those of us that are fortunate to live in the North Coast, we get to see regular uh, presentations of his work on a whole variety of topics, and I think it'll give a, a more of a deeper perspective, perhaps a little bit more on uh, Emily's timeline as to where we've come from from the cultural side of the equation here in the North Coast. So thank you very much for joining us, Jerry. Thank you. Um, you know, I want to welcome all you folks to Humboldt County who haven't been here in the past. And my talk is going to be about uh, the history of uh, sawing and saving the redwoods. So it'll be cover about a hundred years or so of uh, primarily the history of this local area. Um, everyone likes to brag, I guess, about their their home base. And up here we feel really strongly about our redwoods being the biggest and best uh, of anywhere uh, in, on the coast. Uh, that was uh, discovered, oh, 150 years ago or so when uh, the first white people were up here examining the trees and one fellow exclaimed, and he was uh, admiring the height of them, he said, uh, well, these trees are so tall it takes two men and a boy to see all the way to the top of one of them. And uh, that, I think, you know, you will find is proven out as we continue to usually have the, what's claimed to be the tallest redwood anywhere on the coast here in Humboldt County. Well, this looks pretty boring, so let's go on to something a little more interesting. <laughs> well, let me try this instead. So, redwoods sawed like this around 1900. As you can tell from the photo, that's probably about a 12 to 15 foot diameter um, log from the lower part of a redwood. Um, what you might notice um, are three objects that seem to be sort of hanging from the top of that. Those are augers, uh, and they were actually used to bore into large size redwoods that were too big in the early days to uh, be cut by the saws at the local mills. They would uh, bore some of these holes down partway into the uh, center of the tree, uh, put black powder in there, and actually blow these large sections of redwood apart. That was one of the reasons why there was about a 30% loss in redwood material uh, from start to finish of the logging process. And you think about that loss over time and all of the, uh, the uh, tremendous number of acres of redwood trees that have been cut, if that cost could have, or loss could have been reduced down to close to zero, we might have another 200,000 uh, acres of old growth redwood still around that hadn't uh, been uh, spent rather extravagantly by processes like this. And then uh, I'm going to finish up the program with the other side of the coin, redwoods that were never sawed but were saved. Um, focusing primarily on uh, the early movement uh, by the Save the Redwoods League uh, starting in the late 1910s and going on uh, through the next couple of decades where several of the key redwood parks were established up here on the north coast in Humboldt and Del Norte counties. So really what I'm going to look at is what happened to the redwoods in Humboldt County. And I think it's important for us to have this kind of background uh, regardless of how focused you are on 
the present condition of redwoods or trying to deal with what the future is going to be like. If you have a little background of what's happened in the past, I think it's going to uh, increase your sensitivity to current issues and deepen your understanding of those. I notice that one of the topics that's going to be discussed later is the uh, impact of beaver on uh, redwood habitat. And a couple of years ago, I was contacted by some researchers who uh, were working on the question of what was the traditional range of the beaver in California. And we don't have complete records, of course, about that. And my suggestion was, in fact, I provided and a little information about this, was to go to the uh, vocabulary lists of local Indian tribes and find out whether or not each tribe had a word for beaver. And it turns out of the 12 or 15 tribes that were present in Humboldt County 150 years ago, about half of them had a word for beaver and about half of them didn't. And we can figure pretty much if they didn't have a word in their vocabulary for this species, it probably wasn't present in their territory. And the most interesting case uh, uh, turned out to be the Hoopa Indian tribe out in the Trinity River where they specifically told the ethnographer that was interviewing them that yes, they had a word for beaver, but there were no beavers on their tribal land. They'd seen and heard about beavers or seen pelts, and they needed a word to talk about it, but uh, it made it quite clear that for that stretch of the Trinity River, historically, there had not been beaver present. Okay, let's move the head here. This is an interesting map from 1881 showing the uh, state of the coast redwood at that point in time. Uh, the sort of orange uh, colored areas were um, uh, old growth forests that have pretty much been cut by then. The areas uh, in the uh, northern part of the Santa Cruz Mountains uh, and near Humboldt Bay and up into Marin County, the ones closest to the cities in the Bay Area that could most easily be cut. And you know in those early days, the city of San Francisco had a habit of burning up about every five to ten years and for several of those transitions uh, they required a lot of redwood timber to rebuild. The light green uh, you can see which uh, constitutes most of the uh, colored areas here is kind of standard uh, redwood forest and then I'm once again proud to point out that the two dark green areas up here are the areas that uh, have the highest uh, density of redwoods uh, measuring in those days, they figured about 200,000 board feet per acre or better. And that would be the Redwood Creek Mad River area up here, uh, part of which became Redwood National Park and going on down into areas that are still uh, in private timberland. And then uh, this uh, large area on the uh, Eel River, uh, starting pretty much at the area of Scotia where the Pacific Lumber Company had its mill and going upriver from them. That was sort of the base area that the uh, Pacific Lumber Company acquired first of all. I should just mention that uh, Pacific Lumber Company was incorporated in 1869 and it was uh, only 17 years later that they built their mill at Scotia and started logging. The reason why there was a 17 year uh, time lag was that it was in 1869 that the regents of the University of California were first raising money to build the campus at Berkeley and uh, to finance that they were able to sell certain state lands at auction to the public. Well unknown to um, most people at that time. Um, three of the original eight incorporators of the Pacific Lumber Company were regents uh, of the board. And um, I think because of that, uh, they were able to acquire about 11,000 acres of this green prime habitat for $5 an acre. And uh, by the time they were uh, cutting their timber in uh, 17 years later, that had uh, increased in value by about uh, uh, 20 fold. So uh, it was, uh, I guess, the equivalent of insider trading in those days. Okay, 
We're going to look briefly here at what I call the three D's of early logging. We've got a postcard here from maybe the 1890s showing um, how things were operating in those days, including down here in the lower left corner, a fellow that is uh, bringing water in uh, to supply the uh, old steam donkey here that is uh, representing probably the first uh, great um, uh, invention that revolutionized traditional logging where they no longer had to rely, uh, rely on ox teams or horses to move the logs uh, to landings but rather could have uh, these steam donkeys provide uh, the power where they could uh, haul the cables in. And you can see there are a couple of barrels he's going to fill up there with water and then also next to that is a pile of wood. I interviewed a fellow a few years ago who actually worked on a, a very large uh, donkey system, a Skyline loader, one of the largest ones I think we had in Humboldt County. He was about 90 years old at the time. When he was a kid, it was his job all day running back and forth to the nearest creek to get the water that they needed and to bring in the wood to uh, supply the boiler. So anyway, the three D's that I came up with were that logging was dramatic, it was destructive, and it was dangerous. And let's look at that for a minute. Here we are back in Eureka, 1854, the first image we have of the town. It was going to become a city, but in those days, just two streets and about 20 buildings right down near the bay. And uh, of those, we had three mills, the three largest buildings that you see here. Of course, a smiley mill, that's how we first got the smiley figure established. Um, <laughs> but you'll notice the placement of those mills. They aren't up on high ground, they are right down on the water. And in fact, all mills in those days were by the bay. And the reason for that was that all the logs going to those mills had to be transported by water. We had no logging railroads in the 1850s. In fact, there was only one county wagon road in the entire county, and it wasn't really suitable for hauling logs on. So uh, you needed to cut trees that were near the bay. You needed to float them or haul them to your mill, uh, bring them into the mill, cut your timber, and then conveniently place next to these mills usually was a wharf where the timber could be stacked for loading on uh, steam or, or sail-powered ships that would take them to often very distant locations. And uh, here's uh, how some of those logs traveled. Elk River is uh, one of the major tributaries uh, uh, feeding into Humboldt Bay. Uh, here in about 1893, you can see during the summer months, they had ganged together a tremendous number of cut sections of redwood, fairly large uh, sections of tree, and actually just put them right in the dry riverbed. And behind them, they had built a temporary splash dam, and what they're waiting for is the uh, heavy rains that start in the fall, and uh, once those occur, they're going to knock away the splash dam, and the combined force of the water that's released from that, along with uh, the water that's accumulating in the river, wash those trees down Elk River into Humboldt Bay. So there's a statement that was made regarding that river. When I came to be an owner of some land on Elk River about four years ago, the banks of that stream on the back line of my land were about 16 feet deep, pretty deep for the river. Well, four years later, today, they're no more than nine feet deep. Folks will remember in the 1980s, 1990s, the complaints of residents on Elk River about upstream logging uh, contributing to the siltification of uh, Elk River, uh, and it was considerable. And there were some uh, settlements that had to be made at that time to compensate people uh, for the problems that occurred um, because of uh, siltification in the river. Well, this statement was made in the 80s but it was in 1880, not anything uh, close to the present time. Uh, and uh, Barton Glatt, the landowner, was uh, quick to attribute it to the uh, process they were using at the time of the logs in the river. And here, even in 1947, they were still transporting some of the uh, logs by the bay, on the bay, uh, with these log rafts, 
This is probably a load of logs going to the Dolbeer Carson Mill near uh, the Carson Mansion in downtown Eureka. Has to go oh, another half mile to get to that. Um, gradually, uh, of course, as logging railroads came in and eventually truck roads were available, uh, this system stopped. But even there by 47, they were still doing it. And then back in the very early days, you had uh, the true skid roads. Uh, from which we get our term skid row, but uh, these um, uh, perpendicular rows of logs that uh, were set uh, for, uh, to allow the ox teams to haul uh, one or more uh, larger logs along to a landing. And the fellow in the foreground there is the skid greaser. He's got a bucket next to him. Uh, it has some of the leftover fat and grease from the lumber camp and maybe mixed with some water and he's going to spread that on those logs, uh, that, the corduroy type of log, uh, to allow the other logs to speed across them on their journey. How about this? Two choppers at work. This is back in the time when they hand chopped. Uh, you'd have two guys working on a tree at a time. It helped if one of them was left-handed because, of course, they, it, just like in baseball, you know, one guy had the swing from the left. So I like to say that uh, if Barry Bonds had been born a hundred years earlier, he could have gotten a job in a logging camp right away because the lefties were always in demand. Well, so it's one redwood and maybe not for this tree, maybe it didn't take them a week, but this one it would have. This is a 28-foot diameter redwood that's photographed here. And according to the last chopper I could find who was alive, I interviewed him about 1992, and he'd chopped in the 1920s. He said that he and a partner would go out and work five nine and a half hour days and then one half day. And if they had a tree this size or something similar to that, it took them the entire week to cut down that one tree. So you can compare that with how quickly, say in the 1980s, they were able to cut down a redwood in the 1970s with the use of uh, power chainsaws. And um, you can see that in both of these photos, uh, they are standing on staging uh, with uh, using scaffolding to allow them to get up above the butt of the redwood, the flaring part that might have some burls in it. Uh, and in, probably in the black and white photo, they also have gone up quite high so they can get away from some of the rotting material down near the bottom. And they found out pretty quickly that when they uh, cut these trees right down to the base and uh, took them to the log ponds, that butt cut, that heaviest part, would sink down to the bottom of the mill pond and that uh, proved very ineffective. In fact, they had to use contraptions like this. This is at the uh, Corbell Mill of the Northern Redwood Lumber Company uh, where they're actually hauling up sinkers from the log pond. Uh, this is out just a couple of miles north of here in the uh, freshwater uh, canyon where there's extensive logging done in the 1900s by the Excelsior Lumber Company. And you can see where they have a train, a couple of trains here that are essentially each carrying one redwood that's already been sectioned up and are bringing uh, them down for transportation. So we had a, a, some logging railroads by then. Uh, most of them did not go directly into Eureka. In fact, this one, um, if you look at the, the center train there, of uh, the three engines, uh, it moved down through uh, the freshwater canyon came out here. This is the same train actually, same logs as in that other picture. They are now down at Freshwater Slough, about two miles from Humboldt Bay, and they're going to dump their logs into the slough, and those logs will be floated out on the tide into the bay, and they were going to go to the Excelsior um, Mill, which was uh, out on um, Indian Island uh, in the middle of the bay. So we moved up to 1926, and get some idea here of what areas were logged first in uh, Humboldt County. Anything in red had been logged by that time. The light green areas are uh, redwood lands. And as you can see, the areas that got logged first, as you sus suspect, would be the things near 
Humboldt Bay or the areas where they could easily get rail lines into. You notice there's a tremendous amount of uncut redwood up in the northern part of the county where they later established Redwood National Park and Prairie Creek Redwood State Park. There was no rail line up there. There was a company form called the Oregon and Eureka Railroad, and the idea was it would go all the way from Eureka to Oregon, and it never got any farther than Trinidad. And uh, so until they were able to haul logs out by truck, which was much later, uh, these more remote areas were not logged. Uh, there were some attempts uh, to establish community parks. I'm going to get to the larger effort here in just a minute. But uh, here in the city of Eureka, a partly cut over a piece of redwood forest was uh, acquired by the city and became a small park that's still there today, not too far from here, a couple of miles away. And uh, who did they get it from? Barton Glatt, the fellow that had lived down in Elk River and uh, 24 years earlier was complaining about the logging practices affecting his property down there. Okay, now we're going to get into, um, it might seem like I'm picking on the Pacific Lumber Company here for a little while, but the reason is that we have a lot of good photos and you can juxtapose them with what was going on at Humboldt Redwood State Park. Here we are on the main fork of the Eel River, oh, about 10 miles upriver from their mill at Scotia. Uh, this is their Camp Coolin after they had logged this. Uh, they had the camp up at the top of the hill on the far left and uh, they had a, a rail system down in the canyon at the bottom of the grade and they yarded some of the logs up to the top, some down to the bottom. You can see quite a bit of heavy destruction there. If they went up to the top, they were dropped down to the bottom by an inclined railroad and uh, then when they got down into the creek, they actually uh, put the rail line right in Bridge Creek. These, this picture I took about six years ago when we were doing a review out there. And you can see the four or five pilings still standing from uh, where the trestle actually went right up the creek bed. The, uh, the canyon's only 10 to 15 feet wide. The only place they could put the railroad was right on top of the creek. Here's some guys showing off a little later stage uh, as they are moving a log. Uh, and notice, uh, I'm going to show you this right away, uh, they're making use of a standing tree as part of their um, logging operation, using it as a spar tree. And that brings us to, let's see if I can get this to work. Yeah. The high climber. He is going to cut off the top of this tree so they can put rigging on it and they can use it to run a cable system. He's up about 150 to 200 feet, making a perfectly clean cut. I can't even do that just standing on the ground. <laughs> and there it goes. Whoop. And then he waves to us. <laughs> okay. So it gives you an idea what logging used to be like when it was pretty exciting and it was dangerous. And here we have a statement from a logger. Actually, this is uh, from a much later time talking about how dangerous it actually was. Uh, this particular fellow retired after 13 years and three trips to the emergency room uh, with chainsaw cuts. And when you do the math on it and when you look at uh, some of the high lead logging that was done when you have huge sections of trees just moving very quickly through the air, you find out that they had a mortality rate of better than 1% a year. So you do the math on that. If a logger managed to work out in the woods for 40 years, the odds are even he was going to be killed. Even, 50-50. Well, by the 1950s, had huge mills like the Hammond Mill, which is virtually non-existent now out on the Samoa Peninsula. You had a proliferation of mills after World War II. Here we are looking south to Arcata in 1948 with at least 12 conical burners going and more than that that uh, you can't see off the side of the picture. 
but uh, the, as you can see, timber dominated the area. Uh, logging and mill operations were very intense during that time period. So what fate the forest? This is what you saw on the one hand. This is what you saw on the other. This is part of Humboldt Redwood State Park here on the right. Cars became a big deal in the 1910s, and the Redwood Highway that connected San Francisco to this area was being completed in the 1910s. There it went, all the way up to the Oregon border and beyond. Down at Weot on the south fork of the Eel River, three of the founders of the Save the Redwoods League came through and saw a scene like this and realized that something needed to be done quickly if they were going to save any redwood trees right uh, on the highway uh, where most people would see them, where most people uh, who wanted to come up here as tourists wanted to be able to see the trees. In fact, we had our own little movement up here, the Humboldt Women Saved the Redwoods League. And all four of those women were from very prominent families. And in fact, the two women in the center, Kate Harpst on the left, her husband had a shingle mill, and um, Emma Atkinson, uh, right next to the sign, her husband had the uh, Metropolitan Lumber Company Mill uh, north of Scotia. So there was a movement paralleling what was happening statewide up here. Humboldt Redwood State Park established, and this was the first grove that was put in, 1921. You can see uh, John C. Miriam, the president, uh, standing next to the plaque, and over, looking almost like a schoolboy, second guy from the right, is the secretary of the Save the Redwoods League, Newton B. Drury. So that became the first park up here. Uh, here is the... Uh, membership prospectus back at a time when you could uh, be a member for two dollars a year or you could be a founder for five thousand dollars the league proved very adept at raising money from uh, wealthy people but also from uh, uh, individuals who could probably not afford more than the two dollars in a statement from uh, Miriam uh, their president at the time uh, talking about uh, the importance of saving these redwoods for the travelers who would come through and uh, how uh, thousands upon thousands will journey to this part of California to see the greatest and oldest of living things. And that's hundreds of thousands nowadays, of course. Okay, I'm going to finish up here with a little comparison on two sides of the Eel River. Uh, this area is about 10, uh, about 15 miles upriver from the big PL mill at Scotia. The land on this side, Parrot Creek, was logged by the Pacific Lumber Company. On the west bank, uh, it was protected by Humboldt Redwood State Park. Sachote is known as High Rock. That was the Indian name for it that I gave you up there. Here's what it looked like in 26 when PL was logging it. And up by uh, where they were yarding. And Across the way, this is what it looks like today, just across the side of the canyon where uh, Save the Redwoods League was able to purchase land and transfer it to the park. And a little farther away up in the Bull Creek Canyon on the divide, the park on one side, on, in this case on the right side, if you went just a little ways to the left, you'd be in uh, Pacific Lumber Company land in the Bear Creek drainage. And one last one may be the most beautiful trail in any of the parks up here, uh, once again, very close to Pacific Lumber Company land. In fact, there's a small clear cut right on the edge of this grove, but Save the Redwoods League once again was able to come in and save that. And then here's a brief countdown of uh, the parks that were established very early on. Uh, first Humboldt Redwoods in 1921, and then um, four or five more state parks, uh, and then 25 years after the last of those, Redwood National park, uh, which also encompassed the uh, parts of some of the state parks. And then what? So uh, a lot of uh, land was put out of production after the establishment of Redwood National Park, but there was a chance for other types of activities to occur. My wife and I got involved with those. We did a guidebook to the park and sold about 5,000 copies and uh, made a little money on that. And other people realized you could make money on tourism, on people coming up here to look at the trees, not to cut them down, but to walk among them. 
and uh, to appreciate them and also maybe appreciate that we were just uh, saving uh, a certain small part of the biosphere even if you couldn't hike to them. And that for today is the end. Thank you. We have time for a, a question or two, and then we'll break for lunch. I think we have one right up front here, Rick. Referring to that tree that was uh, 28 feet thick, that was cut down, do you have any idea how old a tree like that might be? We don't have a figure on that tree. Uh, there was one cut down at Richardson Grove uh, State Park, which wasn't that large in diameter, but they were able to count the growth rings. That one came out about uh, 2,200 years. And 28 feet in diameter is getting up near the upper range also. Uh, there, there's been reports of trees that were about 30 feet in diameter, and that's about the largest I've heard of. I have a question for you, Jerry. Any comment about the relationship between some of the timber companies and Save the Redwoods League in those, in those early years in terms of the establishment of the park system? Well, in the very early years, Save the Redwoods League was mostly involved in dealing with Pacific Lumber Company. They were trying to save uh, property along the Redwood uh, Highway down on the Eel River, and Pacific Lumber Company was moving down there quite quickly because the rail line had been built through that area. Areas like up by Prairie Creek were not in danger yet because uh, there was no way to get the timber out. Um, and it was a, I would say it was a mixed relationship. It was an uneasy relationship. Pacific Lumber Company for times would agree not to cut for a little while, but then they were found sneaking onto property to actually cut without the uh, knowledge of some of the other people. And eventually they had to institute some condemnation procedures against PL to per se, uh, preserve what finally became the Rockefeller Forest, which now is the largest single stand of old growth forest we have anywhere. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much. That's very, very excellent. Nice context.